Hello, students, how are you? Cambodia Presbyterian Theological Institute, Cambodia. CPTI students. Well, lecture three begins. Um, let's uh, set up for to share the screen. Uh, well, uh, let us go. And okay, good. We are now set. Well, let's pray. Holy Spirit God, come and inspire us again as we continue with this lecture on research method. Give us wisdom and understanding deeply that we could understand your heart, Lord, through our academic research career. Thank you, Lord. Let this endeavor work, be fruitful, and be revelatory, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, round of applause. Lecture three begins. Uh, we're continuing with our Cambodia Presbyterian Theological Institute research and thesis writing steps. Uh, we went through introduction, step one, two. Oh, now this is three. Uh, I think we would probably go a little faster because uh, start, start filing system and set a backup system, uh, it's very technical. So first two were quite involved, but start filing system is something that I think you are already doing. And I, I hope uh, that you already have some kind of system. Um, so, well, like for example, when you go to your computer, this is what you should have, right? So this is my computer. Um, it is set up so that uh, when I type anything, especially my, at the time, PhD, that everything goes to the Dropbox automatically so that nothing will be lost. But I set it up so that uh, I have a lot of files, but I sort it out as A1 document. Once you do that, then it always becomes first. And then I had a PhD documents, and based on that, I had major concept, uh, analysis, appendix, bibliography, computer software, dean's review, first chapter, interview, methodology chapter, patron chapter, publication, qualitative research file, research method, research stages, and things like that. Um, so I'm sure you have already set up. Otherwise, uh, you need to. Uh, you just use, you use a common sense, a logic, of how you want your master thesis to work out, and then you categorize it, right? So major concept, for example, there are major concepts based on your category of research, correct? So when you click that, then out of the major concept, you, I had A dependency paper, A defectiveness paper, A and A dependency, animism, Buddhism, case study, coding, epistemology, Kapanur, grounded theory. You see all these categories now, uh, it's, it's very important that you have those categories because all these things eventually either become a chapter or part of the chapter of your master thesis. Okay? And so when you have all these categories uh, in place, then it's easier later to go at it. Uh, sometimes, you know, because uh, my PhD was eight years long, I forgot I wrote 30 page essay on a topic completely. So for example, a dependence issue, so when you click there, uh, all these papers that I read and papers I wrote on a dependency is in category. So start with the concept, a dependency, and then a dependency, when you click on it, all these paper will be categorized, right? From, um, and you need to do that because you're going to forget what you studied, what you read. And so learn from the very beginning meticulously categorizing and constantly working at it so that when you have idea and when, like for example, I wanted to write a book on a dependency, all these papers, they came into play and I didn't have to reshuffle, refine. It's impossible once you just put it everywhere, right? So another concept is for, for example, thesis. So now you see how it was start from Dropbox, A1 document, 
PhD, Oxford, and then, you know, instead of major concept, I now go to thesis. So when you categorize like that, when you click on to thesis, then I'm going to have 2014, 2015, 2017 thesis. So when you click on to 2017 thesis, then you have first draft, second draft, ninth draft, 12th draft, 13th draft, right? So it's over and over and over again. It's not something that you could do it overnight. You do it and then you get criticized and then you get it, remaster it, rewrite it, then becomes a third draft, then becomes a fourth draft, then redo it, then becomes your fifth draft. Uh, I think, wow, I guess uh, I did 13 draft, right? And when you click onto the 13 draft, um, yeah, well, I, I was gonna do live demo, but should I do it? Let me see in terms of time. Okay, maybe I could. So, uh, no, I think, no, let's, uh, let's move on. So I, I, I think this is very, something that you have already done, I hope. Uh, if not, when I meet you in person, that we could really talk about that and, and students could kind of share about how you are setting up your uh, filing system, your in electronic filing system, right? Uh, very important. Now you need to set up backup system. This is also very, very important. Okay, this has to be all done before you start writing. You cannot just start right without having all this system in place because you could write right and then you're gonna put it everywhere and then it's all gonna get lost, right? So important thing is you have to have a filing system and now you need to have a backup system. What is a backup system? Well, you have your computer when you write, the computer has a, what? Internal hard drive, right? Internal memory. So you need to back up, put it, you know, you, you're backing up into that file, right? So you're backing up, very important, you do that. And you have a system where you back up daily, hourly. Uh, my writing thing, every 15 minutes, it automatically back up and puts, puts it away. So in case there's a system failure, that I only have to repeat first fifth, the, the 15 minutes of my writing. So you need to have a computer backup. And then you have to have, of course, you know, a uh, flashcard, right? Uh, just your master thesis, nothing else. And that's just don't just use one, use several, right? Because you could just, your, your entire master thesis research, if it's a text space, it's a book reports and paper, then I mean, one gig we should be enough, unless it's a lot of video and interview, uh, video interview and things like that. I'm sure you won't be able to record video interview anyway. So make sure you have several of these and constantly back up your, your file, right? Now, third system that I use is uh, Dropbox. So every time I write something, it gets put in my computer, and then time to time, I'll stick it, my, you know, the, what do you call that? Sticky sticks, memory sticks. <laughs> and then uh, third way, some of you could, some of you don't have to, but I do. Actually, I have fourth system, but third way in which is the Dropbox. Everything that I do gets dumped into Dropbox. And then the fourth way that I do is the iCloud. So I'm covered. So when I, everything I write, uh, if I lose my computer, then I could download everything from Dropbox or iCloud or my external hard drive, okay? So you must have a system where um, you will safeguard uh, your thesis, especially while you're, um, while you're um, writing, right? Uh, so it's a good habit of backing up. I have a horror story of my friend that's actually a uh, london airport london airport uh, my friend good friend named uh, dr tom wolf he's a brilliant brilliant man and he was doing his phd at england in london uh, and i think it was his fourth or fifth year so he was almost finishing his thesis was almost done but he should know better but he only had one backup system. 
He only stored everything in his computer. He had no memory stick. He had no Dropbox. He had no iCloud. He had no external hard drive. He kept everything that he wrote in one computer, computer hardware, hard drive. Guess what? He was working on his PhD while waiting for his airplane. And he left the computer and told the neighbor, please watch my computer while I'm going to my restroom. When he went to restroom, came back, everybody were boarding. So he hurriedly got on the airplane and he did not bring his computer. So somewhere from London and Los Angeles that he was flying in, he said, oh, no, he cried. It was too late. Computer was gone. He couldn't find it back. And he basically quit. He, he said, I, there's no way I could go back and do another four or five years of research, and all the data, all the interview. I mean, I said, how in the world were you, I mean, didn't anybody tell you before you began your research and your PhD and your writing that you cannot do that, right? So this is very important. Although it sounds like, yeah, it's elementary. No, it's to make sure that you have not only filing system, right? That makes sense to you. So you could trace back. The key point is that you could go back and find, locate. You know, if you want to find a dependency paper, is it all categorized? Is it in PDF format? Or uh, things like that. Very important, right? So that's step four. Now, step five is a little, little difficult. And I'm going to just go through it and explain to you. But I don't really expect you to fully understand this because it's quite complex issue. But I will put it in a simple form and I'm going to follow up on this because it's also very critical. Before you start writing, you got to have a direction. Right? You cannot just like, OK, uh, I, I OK, uh, do you want to go see Enria? Or do you want to go Batamba? Or do you want to go Kampong Song? Right? OK, you're starting from Phnom Penh. Well, if you go Siem Reap, then you got to take the different road, right? As you make the circle, right? To exit Phnom Penh, you got to go that way. If you want to go, what? Batamba, you go this way, right? And if you want to go, Uh, where, 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 what did I say? <laughs> Kampong Song, uh, you don't even have to go there. You go through the other way, other side, right? It's like that. Make a decision on direction of your paper. What do I mean by that? Well, you have to decide, is it going to be deductive or is it going to be inductive? Okay, if you never heard that before, then, then you need to be very, very certain. The direction of your paper will determine how you write your paper. Okay, so if you're going, am I going Siem Reap or am I going Kampong Song? You have to make a decision. It's like that because it's going to take a totally different road. Because inductive and deductive approach is, is, is all different. Inductive reasoning or inductive approach is observation. You observe what's happening and you come with pattern, and then he said, oh, OK. And you have hypothesis and come up with theory. Okay? If it's a financial aid or a dependency issue, make observation. How come all these thousands of churches, oh, there's a pattern. There's only a few churches are in Cambodia are financially independent. Tentative hypothesis, Cambodian churches are financially dependent and come up with the theory. There will be inductive reasoning research. The, the other way, the deductive reasoning is you start with the theory. Cambodian churches are financially dependent. What's the hypothesis? Well, because they are poor and they don't give. And go to the field and make observation, do survey, interview. How much offering do you get per month? 
and then confirmation, yes, Cambodian churches are financially dependent. So both saying the same thing, but where you approach is different. Inductive reasoning starts with observation. Deductive reasoning starts with the theory. You see the difference? So inductive, start with data, making observation, right? And I make conclusion from my data. Now, this tend to be qualitative research, qualitative research, okay? Uh, so the whole thing on, is it going to be qualitative or is it going to be quantitative? And you're gonna be constantly asked that question, okay? Tend to be qualitative. What about deductive? Deductive, you start with the theory, you confirm with the hypo hypothesis or and then you tend to be quantitative, right? So qualitative versus quantitative is something that you have to make a decision, right? But is it always verse? Can it be both qualitative and quantitative at the same time? Okay, this is a part that I, I don't want you to get all nervous saying, oh, I don't understand. Oh, I don't know what to do. We're gonna go through this uh, step by step especially when I see you face to face in the class, we're gonna go over that. But just know that that's something that you must make a decision. Is it gonna be qualitative or quantitative? Because through my PhD, after eight years of doing PhD, I realized it doesn't have to be just one or the other. Now, this is kind of a new thing. I call it existential epistemology, epistemology, where the epistemological understanding meets the ontological. And this is little, yeah, it's more PhD level, but I just want to share with you that there are different ways to look at different things, okay? So for example, what do you see? Do you see a young woman or do you see an old woman? I know some of you are like, what old woman? I only see a young woman, really? Okay, no, you should see both. There is an old woman. If you see her face, nose, her entire face as a nose, then you see a old woman. But if you see a little nose as a nose of a woman, then you see a young woman. Okay, some of you, I, I, I hope you see both. <laughs> what about this? What do you see? Do you see angels or do you see devil or bats? Black are bats, white are angels. Wow, you know, yeah, there's both, right? So let's say this is truth. The object is a truth. The way you shoot at the light, when you shoot light from the left to right, then you see circle. From right to left, then you see square. Wow. And people only seeing the image say, well, this is true. No, this is true. This is what I see. What, what is truth then? Right? Like people who said, well, I see six. The other guy said, what do you mean? It's nine, right? Sometimes qualitative research could see six, but quantitative could see nine. That's my point. So same thing, I see God, G-O-D. From the other side, no, I see dog, D-O-G, right? So which is right? Well, the whole ontology and epistemological approach talks about world outside us could only come through our experience and our interpretation of experience. It's what we're writing about. So whether it's quantitative, qualitative, actually there is a line where you could embrace both. So if that is a truth, when we say, is it this or is it that? Is this, this true or is this true? It's called either or paradigm. Or, but this is true, both and. That object itself, the existence of that object itself is a truth. It's called both and. So the whole understanding of my research, I started in research 2009 and until 2011, I did deductive, I did more of the quantitative. And then I begin to do inductive. I start doing quality. I start 
doing both, right? First part and then I did inductive. So you have to make a choice. Do you want to do qualitative data or quantitative data? Now, I suggest for a master level thesis, you choose one or the other. Because you are only writing about 70 pages. Okay? Uh, the PhD, anywhere from 250 to 300 pages. So if you could write 300 pages, then you could then talk about, yes, I start with quantitative. And then eventually after three, four years, I moved to qualitative and start doing interview. And so I embrace not versus, but both. Did you see that? So that it's not just either qualitative or quantitative. No, I said it's both qualitative and quantitative data. And I was able to uh, produce that. And then I was very happy that I was able to do that because it gave a different paradigm of doing research. Right. And so important is that, so are you ready? Um, then you need to make a decision. Is it before you start writing? Because the next step is start writing. But you, before you start writing, then you need to say, or to think in your mind, is it going to be, am I going to gather data and read and, and then get data and then come up with consensus and come up with a theory? Or am I going to start with the theory and then write out and affirm or dis disagree with the theory. Okay, you have to make a choice. And we'll talk more about that in person. Yeah, it's hard to do because I don't read your expression or, you know, you could raise your hand and ask on the spot, but I cannot. So we'll talk about step five in person, right? And then step six is, I mean, you start, you start writing, you start writing, you start writing write everywhere just start writing once you make the decision so let's go back so you know your research question you know your research question and you processed okay i know what i want and you did your literature review you read you read you read and start categorizing you have all these outlines and you have all these high points and then you have a filing system you put everywhere in the computer and you have a backup system, right? And now you know, okay, I'm going to go Siem Reap or I'm going to go Kampong Song. Now you need to make a decision. You go this way or that way. So if you want to do quantitative research, then you better, there's a new set of stuff that you need to learn. Like if it's quantitative, you need to know how to do survey. You need to do the data processing differently. You gotta do the number. You gotta maybe have to learn Excel uh, to, to quantify crunch the number, come up with, 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 with statistic. So you really have to do a little bit of learning on statistic, right? So quantitative, if that's the way that you want to go. There's nothing, it's not like right and wrong. It's like, what does your research question demand, right? So, and if you want to do qualitative, then you need to know how to interview. You need to learn, read, read books on, qualitative research books. And, you know, I brought some books that I will share with you. If you want to do qualitative, there are some books that you could read, learn, uh, and maybe I could just do a whole lecture on that. Maybe I will do that. But once all these are done, then you start writing, right? You start writing, writing, whether with pen, typing, doesn't matter. Pen, pencil, type, crayon, doesn't matter. You write everywhere, notes, paper, uh, post it, stick it, write, 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 write everywhere, right? I mean, I have a pen and notebook next to my bed, right? This is my bedroom right now. I'm in quarantine. My wife is in the outside living room, so I'm in the bedroom. But next to, there's a pencil note. I always carry a note on my side. Uh, like, I have this revelation, taking a bath. 3 a.m. today, you know, 3 a.m. I woke up at 2.44 and at 3 a.m. I was taking a hot bath. I go, wow, you know, this is what I need to do. And, you know, I got out and I wrote, you know. So make sure you write constantly everything and, and the theme that you have. You see how you could draw, you could, you know. Uh, right? 
So, um, yeah, I think that's enough. I think we're going to talk about categorizing later. But um, so let's back up a little. Because I think before writing, uh, the quantitative and qualitative uh, is something that you need to kind of wrestle with today. Right? What is qualitative? The definition is qualitative data is information that cannot be expressed as a number. Like, so when I did patron client relationship, it's not, it cannot be quantified in number. It's relational, right? Can data be counted? Not necessarily. That's why you need to do interview. Data types is words, object, pictures, observation, and symbols. In the other hand, quantitative, it, that can be expressed as a number or can be quantified. Can data be counted? Yes. Number and statistic. For example, when I was studying uh, pastors uh, who had been in ministry for many years, I had about 20 of them in the room, and I gave them a survey sheet. How many years you've been in ministry? What area? What church? Do you get support by uh, foreign mission missionaries? How much? How many member in your church? What's your uh, weekly week? What's your weekly offering or monthly offering? And these are all numbers. Like so, I have twenty five pastors from seven areas, and average of most of them was in ministry more than ten years. And more most of them have congregation more than fifty people, but most of them the monthly offering is less than two hundred, or one hundred fifty, or eighty dollars. So these are numbers. These are quantitative data. And, and I've done that. And then as I've done quantitative data, I realized, but I can never get to why still these churches, some churches are financially independent, some churches not. And then I start interviewing them one by one, right? Uh, and, and through interview, I was able to get different kind of data, which was words, object, pictures, observation, and so on. And, and, and that's how I came up with or patron client relationship. So, yeah, so, and I was able to use both methods. And as I said already, for master level thesis, you just want to stick to one because, you know, actually 70, 80 pages is not that long. You know, uh, you, you, what you're going to find out that there, there are very, you really have to be smart and then just write precisely, concisely what you want to write and then have a wonderful thesis, right? And then you start writing, writing, typing, writing everywhere. So good. Uh, I hope uh, um, this made sense. Uh, I, I'm excited uh, to see you soon uh, in February. And then, so if you actually have a question, uh, just write it down. Like in your note, when you write your lecture note, lecture three, question, right? And then you raise it. And so that we could talk about this. We'll have a review session of that, of what we're going to cover in this YouTube lecture. Well, Holy Spirit, God, bless them. <laughs> Touch us. We may grasp the truth. We may live according to your will, Lord God, and become the guru, the teacher of the truth. That we would, Father, be precise and accurate and will not be lazy and sloppy about teaching the truth to our people. Thank you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Lord bless you guys. See you next lecture.